All right. Good morning, Money.net Live. Here we go. Roddy Renan. Hey, man, the, the markets are a little bit wonky right now. We've just had Christine Lagarde come out. It's still raising rates there. Uh, Janet Yellen screaming about ESG and climate change and the world's falling apart. Uh, talk to me, Rodney. Yeah, I mean, we're in crazy times. Even if, if you look at SVB and the way they collapsed, I, I think they, they gave $75 million to Black Lives Matter. They were having... Uh, um discussions about what bathroom to use i mean they, they forgot they forgot about uh risk there um they forgot about what's going on um which is important and it's, it's just destroying our financial system you know so you talked about it earlier you said the, the, there were some parallels of 2008 are you are you saying that that's what's happening no this is different than 2008 but it's kind of similar from a trading perspective. I mean, traders out there, you guys have some phenomenal trading the last five days. I mean, you have an average true range in FRC of like 40 points one of those days from 80 to 40, from 40 to 80. I mean, you hopefully you grab some of those points. That would have been amazing. But um, the parallels are, are there, you know. I mean, you see one regional bank, you short every single other one. Um, we're listening to exactly what's going to happen. I mean, listen, these are still bailouts. Don't kid yourself. We're letting the equity go to zero, but you got to pay attention. They put they put that lending facility in place. So what's important about that is that a lot of these assets are trading underwater, big time underwater, yeah. and they, they need to sell them on the open market to raise cash for the money that's coming out of the bank. But what the Fed did is they're saying that you could borrow at par instead of mark to market. So instead of being down 30% on an asset, you're going to be able to borrow at 100%. And that's a bailout because yep. there's no liquidity there to be able to hit the bid. If everyone starts hitting the bid, you're, it's going to be down 30, 40, 50, 60% at that point. And once again, there's market shenanigans going on. Um, I don't see this as a free market anymore. It's just rigged to the upside, in my opinion. Wow, it's written to the upside. All right. So yeah. you're saying we should just be buying all day long then, right? I, I mean, listen, history has shown us that someone who buys and waits, you're gonna you're gonna make money. Look at the Dow, it's at 30,000. In 2008, it was at 13,000. Just look, just look at everything in front of you. And yeah, again, you could make let's say, let's say I shorted FRC at 80 and it went to zero. I'd make a hundred percent. But if I bought FRC at 40 and sold it at 60, I made 50% right there. If I bought it at 40 and it went to 80, I'd make 100%. And if it went above 80, I'd make more than 100%. On the right. short side, you can only cap out at 100. Right. And I, I think that's a very good point. You know, if you look back in 2008, AIG was uh, considered to be too big to fail. Um, that We didn't even have those words until uh, Paulson came out and talked about that, right? Um, you know, Paulson being a former Goldman Sachs guy saying, you know, look, if we let some of these banks at that time go down, um, they're backstopping the whole United States, AIG being an insurance as well. We, we'd have a, some real problems. But SIVB isn't the end all be all. These are, you know, startup companies out in Silicon Valley. Um, there's some cracks in some of these banks. But you said it best, I think, earlier before the show that these are real banks. These aren't just like, you know, they're not banks that uh, haven't yeah. been around for a while. These aren't like brand new internet banks like the SIBB. Some of these banks are getting slopped for no other reason. Is it, is it, is it a baby in the bathwater situation here? I mean, listen, everyone's scared and rightfully so. And it's people's money at stake. Listen, the Fed kind of needs to come out and just be like, listen, all, ins all deposits are insured no matter how high they are. That'll probably stop the bleeding. And honestly, between you and me, if they say something like that, I think you short JP Morgan because then all these banks have that have that same security. They're basically a fortress. You short JP Morgan, you buy all the rest of the regional banks. They say something like that. I believe that uh, Kramer called JP Morgan a fortress though too, didn't he not? Yeah, maybe I'll go to zero now. But um <laughs> but no, it, it really is a fortress. I mean, that was too big to fail in 2008 and given the inflows, I don't know what the numbers are. It, it's got to be at this point too big to fail times 20. Hmm. Yeah, because, you know, one of the things you always see in this kind of times is, uh, is M&A, right? And oh. you have to wonder, some of these banks are getting swallowed up and, and uh, act, you know, accumulated by bigger banks. Do you think there's going to be more consolidation within the industry here? Yeah, I think so. I mean, unless the Fed comes out and says, 
over 250,000 is insured. But even then, let's say a bank goes bankrupt, right? And your money's in there. Who wants to fill out paperwork and, and, and report things and wait probably God knows how long it's going to take the government to give you your money back. I'd rather just move it to JP Morgan. You know, I mean, <laughs> and that's how I would feel. If I was a First Republic customer, I'd be moving my money money out of there, even though it's probably not going to go to zero. But but who wants to deal with the government? Uh, not, not too many people. Um, all right. Uh, we just had some interesting uh, news just coming out here that uh, Microsoft here is unveiling Microsoft 365 Copilot for work. Um, that's a very good point. We're seeing chat GPT, AI. Is this really going to be a part of how we do business now from now on? 100%. The tech sector is in big time trouble, in my opinion. This yep. SVB bank is a disaster for them. And then you have chat AI and you have all these other things coming out. I love this chat GPT. I use it. I'm not going to lie. I write emails with it. I, I write what I want and I say, write it for me in a professional manner. And it sounds like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm king. So it's doing a lot and it's going to replace a lot of these guys. I had it write a VBA code for me. I mean, what do I need a coder for? Yeah, I, I mean, I've said this five years ago that developers will eventually be a thing of the past as we just we just talk to our machine and, and tell it what kind of program we want it to make. and It's going to make it for us and we're done. Right. Um, you know, I, but the question is, will we as as regular consumers, will we be using this on a daily daily basis? Will I be talking to uh, and I go to the if I go to the grocery store, will I say, OK, uh, there's lemons there. Where'd the lemons come from? And, they'll, they'll, you know, a whole thing about the lemons. Right. Right? And then I'll get a, why is it good for me? And was it, you know, will yeah. we be able to see, will we be able to see, no, this is a better lemon, lemon stand over here. And, and, and it might be too confusing for some people, I think at first. I don't think it's going to get that cr I mean, maybe, maybe down the line, but we're just in the early stages. I think you really got to think about universal basic income at this point. Um, I'm not, a, I wasn't a fan of it, but uh, Mr. Yang, he was onto something. All these people at some point, uh, what are they going to do? Let's say you're a coder, you're a developer, and I could just tell some program to just do it for me. What's that guy going to do? But you know, don't you think I'm it's wrong. like the buggy whip and the horse and, uh, in the turn of the century when cars were coming around, people will learn to do something different, right? Yeah, I would hope so. But you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of people, people who are used to making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year. They just laid uh, 10,000 people off at Facebook, Meta, whatever you want to call it. And right. between you and me, I have a friend that used to work at Meta. He was making $600,000 a year with stock, comp, everything. He just took a job making 190000 And you're talking about this guy that was the best of the best. So you went from 600000 to making 190000 So you got to think the scale is, is going to drop. And a lot of people are going to be washed out. Maybe we won't offshore to India anymore. Maybe we won't offshore to Brazil. There's just mm. so many people out there. I'll pay someone who's average seventy five thousand, for example, who was making two fifty. Right. All right. Well, let's let's move a little bit to the to the what I want to talk about, um, which is the next sector. I think that's going to get hot, and it's it's futures markets, right? I think the futures markets, commodities. I know have been hot. But we're not, we're seeing, we saw this big push into options markets, right? But yep. there's more leverage in the futures markets um, and there's less to play with. So that helps narrow them down for them a little bit. Um, do, what do, you, do you see that happening for retail traders moving into the futures markets? See, I don't really know. I think it's more for the pros, the futures. It's 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 open around the clock, you know. It's it's uh, I have someone who trades the e minis and stuff. You're also like getting away from the stocks and you're just trading the indexes. Right. I mean, I love the futures market, but as a trader, I would just kind of just pay attention to the futures and see what they're doing. Um, there's going to be money there, but you guys don't want to lever up too high. I think it's still a professional game. But listen, everyone got into the options. Maybe they get into the futures, but I would have assumed that futures would have come before options. But we'll see how that shakes out. But I think the retail investors really like the individual names. You're not going to get meme craziness and all that stuff. It, it's it's more, of a, more of a gamble to choose specific stocks as opposed to getting involved in the futures. And speaking and of futures. I've never been a futures, stock, a futures trader. Gotcha. And, and speaking of futures, uh, oil has been uh, dropping significantly. We're back, we're back up a little bit here at 68 bucks a, a, a barrel. 
but uh, the gold market also 1922. So it does seem to me that we're starting to spread out a little bit of uh, investment. It's not all stocks. It's not all cannabis and meme stocks. And, and no. uh, yeah. Well, we're in a crazy time right now. I love gold. Gold is awesome. Because listen, what the Fed's doing is inflationary because this money still has to come from somewhere. And the Federal Reserve's broke. They're, they're negative 1.1 million. Actually, it's funny. This is the Swiss National Bank. The Hot Shots lost $144 billion last year. They're coming and bailing out Credit Suisse. It's like, well, what's, I don't even know what's going on. It's just, <laughs> they're just pulling money out of thin air. And that's good for gold. Bitcoin fixes this, right? Listen, Bitcoin, Bitcoin listen, it made a run to 26,000. That's exactly where it should have stopped. That's where the resistance level was. It pulled back with probably around 25,000. But yeah, I mean, listen, you have a bank run. You're taking your money out. You probably go buy Bitcoin. But bank runs don't happen that often. So we found the use case for Bitcoin, the bank run. And gold, gold, Goldman Sachs just admitted a few minutes ago that there's a lot of money rolling into money markets. Uh, to me, that says that's very bullish uh, because that means people are starting to push their money into money markets out of cash. Um, ready to be deployed into the stock market. Um, is that what we're seeing here in the next few months here? Yeah, I think you're going to see uh, money markets and you're seeing all these yields drop because people are trying to buy these T-bills. You know, those are way, those are guaranteed. Um, they're strong. And you've seen crazy, crazy 100 basis point moves in like three, four days. Right. That's insane. That's meme stock-esque. And do you see the same situation in the currency Forex markets as well? I mean, I like the currency markets. You got to pay attention to the dollar. We have the pullback in the dollar, but still Dixie's around 104, 105. Um, listen, we got to talk about the Fed. What's the Fed going to do next week? What do you think? I think it's 25 basis points and that's it. They stop after that. And then I think they actually, I said this quite a bit, that we actually cut before the end of the year, maybe December. I think that, I think we actually do see a cut this year. Very possible. I think they have to do 25 basis points because five days just before- save, Just, just to save face. I mean, exactly. If you, if you think about it, Rodney, this is the first time in a while that I have not heard a Fed speaker talk. I mean, uh, they've got super quiet. Yo, they're in, they have, they're balancing. This is, they're on the, they're on the tightrope here, you know, <laughs> 30,000 feet in the air. I mean, they're in a really, really difficult spot. I wouldn't want to be there. But four days before that, he was being hawkish. He was being, all, he was, he was saying like, we got to do it. We got to do it. We were going to do fifty basis points to save face. They have to do twenty five basis points between you and me. If they, if they don't do anything, it's going to be worse than if they do because it's going to show. It's going to say, hey, what that? What do they know that we don't know? If right. they're not raising that 25 bits. Because, because at zero, not raising at all admits failure, admits that they were wrong. And I don't I don't think the Fed wants to admit that. No, they're going to look Even though I think that they're wrong, they shouldn't be raising. Um, I think that it would be to them, it would be admitting that they were wrong. Well, at this point, them being right is going to be what's the surprise. They've been wrong on everything from it being yeah. transitory, from it, uh, not, no inflation, from they, they have no idea what's going on. Um, between you and me, I think it's really, really hard for them to really understand. Like Gunlock was on the other day, and I, I, and I encourage every listen to these guys that have been doing this for a long time. And even Gunlock said, I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I've never seen a rising rate environment. We've never. always seen yeah. we've always seen rate cuts. So he's like, listen, my playbook and what I think is going to happen is based on the past. But based on the past, this has never happened. So my experience of the past is very, very hard to extrapolate what's going to happen now. But we've been given the sugar bowl to people for so long here, uh, for, for for most traders, right? That they don't really know what it's like to be in, in, a, in a rate environment of 5 to 10%. Nope. They've never seen it, right? Um, it, to me, we've put the sugar bowl in front of everybody and stuck their face in it. Now, now we, uh, we pulled that sugar bowl out too fast, is what I think. Yeah, I mean, not only are we raising rates, we're raising rates at a historic, historic pace. And people are addicted to that sugar, Steve. I don't know what to tell you. Um, <laughs> but I think they got to get off that addiction. Maybe everyone needs to move away from their computers and uh, go to rehab, stock stock market rehab. Stock market rehab. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Rodney <laughs> Renan, always a blessing, man. Thank you so much. We'll see you right back here next week. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. Good times.